the panelists to come up. It's the globalization of sports, identifying the next generation of players, fans, and corporate partners. Anton Thun and Brian Burke, they're both joining this panel, coming from the last one. We're also pleased to welcome Jordan Vader, MLSE Head of Global Partnerships. Before that, he worked with corporate sales and corporate partnerships and did so also with the CFL. David Proper, he's held the role of Executive VP Media and International Strategy with the NHL since 2011. Prior, he was the Vice President of Programming with Time Warner Cable and before that, Senior Media Counsel with the National Football League. He's actually been integral in the development of the NHL's Global Series and the growth in the Chinese market. And our moderator is Dave Hopkinson. He's the head of business operations for the Real Madrid Football Club in Madrid, Spain. What a place to live. He began that job in July 2018. Prior to moving overseas this past summer, he spent over 23 years at MLSE, eventually becoming the chief commercial officer in 2013. So I'll leave it to him. It's the globalization of sports, identifying the next generation of players, fans, and corporate partners. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, gentlemen, we have got an esteemed panel here. It's a bit, a bit, a bit of a scramble play, but we put together. I, actually, I'll tell you what, I think this panel is, a, is an upgrade, and I may, want to make sure that that gets back to Bez, uh, if you wouldn't mind I'll there, Vince. Sure yeah. um, globalization in sports. Um, somewhere along the way, the world got very, very small very, very quickly, especially the sports world. And I remember this uh, hit me very dramatically a few years ago, about five years ago, I was in China and we were looking at some data and what uh, I, we learned at the time was that at that time, the most recognized face in the Chinese marketplace was no longer Mao Zedong, it wasn't Chairman Mao, it, he had been surpassed by LeBron James. And it was just one of those things that, that really hit me and I, I wanna ask our panelists in a minute here, when they realized the world was getting uh, so small and so rapidly. You can't go to a business conference now without hearing about transformation, business transformation, and without talking about innovation. And I think very often when we hear those things, we think digital, because digital is disrupting our world, necessitates business transformation, necessitates innovation, but I, I really do believe that globalization in and of itself is necessitating this business transformation. So, Dave, talk to us about the NHL, a league that um, is uh, rapidly expanding internationally. When did it hit you that the world's getting really small, and, and, and how is the NHL viewing this and, and responding to this changing marketplace? Well, well, when it hit us, God, I don't know. It, it seems like every time we take a look, we see more and more international, non-North non -North American players in our league, and certainly, when you look at superstars, we're uh, blessed to have a number of non-North Americans playing in our league that are superstars at this point. I think it really started to hit when we started to get players and, and uh, federations and media partners asking us to start doing more internationally. We sort of felt like there was a lot of the players would come over and they would get lost in their local communities. And that probably happened until the digital boom started to hit. And now people were much more available and people could get a lot better content, a lot more content and a lot more one-on-one -on -one with these players. And then there became a significant demand for us to make them more accessible. That obviously culminated for us uh, initially in the playing of games and bringing players back to their, their uh, locales like Nico Hischer to Switzerland or uh, Leon Dreisaitl to Germany. But that whole concept of getting smaller is really, you have to be very careful. And that's the thing that we've found more than anything else is as small as it's gotten, it hasn't really changed in terms of the way the world operates, as you might imagine. And so I think one of the mistakes we made is we misconstrued, or, or a number of people made, we misconstrued smaller for simply we apply what we do here everywhere else. And one of the biggest challenges that we've had on a going forward basis has been accurately targeting each market in the way that's specific to that market and not mistaking the fact that the world has become smaller for the world has become homogeneous. And that's been probably the biggest challenge we've focused. So you're talking about time. regionalization. Correct. And so how many international offices would the NHL open now? We've obviously got Canada, we've got the head office in New York. Have we got other international offices? Do you use partners? How, how do you solve for regionalization? Yeah, well, 
what we've done, we're in the process of opening offices and, and we're frankly right now focusing very hard on trying to open an office in China. It's, there's a lot of things you have to go through, but I expect that China and Europe will have offices opened in the near, very near future. I think we're a little behind on that. Where we have really focused our efforts to become regionalized is by working with local partners, by working with companies that are very familiar with the sports landscape. Even if we had an office that was up and running, I think having that expertise across a wide variety of different areas has been instrumental to us, whether it's media or um, uh, sponsorship or games or any kind of events kind of uh, process. Got it. Thank you. So, uh, Jordan, uh, the team perspective. Uh, as I think most of the audience knows, the NHL, the NBA, Major League Soccer, you have not really got your rights outside of a defined home territory. So uh, how do you and how does MLSC view the opportunity and, 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 and perhaps some of the restrictions around international development of, of your team brands and your team businesses? Absolutely. Now, there's a few kind of inflection points that, I, that I'll share around our, our few sports um, that we run that I think gave us some perspective on the global opportunity. Um, you know, it's probably 12 years ago now when we're starting Toronto FC. I think we're sitting, uh, and, and Dave, you know this, we probably had around 3,500 season seat holders, and then David Beckham signs with the LA Galaxy. And all of a sudden, uh, a little North American uh, Major League Soccer League became an internationally recognized league. Another moment of inflection, I think, for us on the, on the world of, of soccer, football, was when Sebastian Giovanco, probably one of the best Italian footballs in the world, footballers in the world, in his mid-20s decided to come to, ma to Major League Soccer and you know, live out the prime years of his career here in Toronto, play Major League Soccer. Um, on the hockey side, um, one of the biggest eye-openers for me, you've got you know, Hockey Night in Canada, longest standing show uh, in Canadian history, something like 70 years. Um, highest viewed show uh, in prime time throughout any week, yet it's about a fifth of the audience that's watching on CCTV in China on any given night when the Maple Leafs play. So that was a bit of another you know, eye-opener for us. Um, you know, building on that, you know, when it comes to, to basketball, I think, I think there were a bunch of times, I think you, you date us back to the dream team and seeing the impact that, uh, you know, the dream team had years ago uh, in the NBA, kind of being one of the first to discover the, the opportunity in the, in the Chinese market. Um, but I look back a couple years ago and I started seeing some of the rights and distribution deals for content that, um, that the NBA was doing and you realize the size and scope of the fandom and it forced us to pay a lot more attention in terms of what the commercial opportunities would represent for us. Anton, uh, you've been in the player business your entire career. Has that business always been global? Has how is how's your part of the business changed? Uh, the, the business has been global, I guess, probably since the first. Uh, when I when I say global, it's not really global. It's North American based and European based since the first Europeans came over to play in the National Hockey League. Uh, we represent some clients that are from Europe. So we've had some German and some Finnish and some Swiss and some uh, Swedish players and some Danish players for that matter. Uh, so it's global to that extent. I, I think that the sport. The, the national hot the, the sport is a global sport I don't think that the National Hockey League has a global footprint um, the opportunity to me I think you had mentioned I used you're going to use your words the NHL is rapidly expanding internationally I don't think they're rapidly expanding internationally at all and I think that ac expansion should have started 25 or 30 years ago with the uh, uh, influx of players like uh, Matt Sundin and the Sedin, tw Sedin twins and Marcus Naslin, many players who, who Brian had in Vancouver. These guys are national icons that were not marketed at all in Europe. And we now have Elias Pettersson with Vancouver and we have Nick Baxter with, uh, with uh, Washington Capitals. These guys are heroes back home, and we really need to do something to maximize the sport in Europe that we haven't been doing before. I think the NHL is now taking some incremental steps. Um, I think changing uh, games on Saturdays and having the broadcasts at noon or at one o'clock in the afternoon so that audiences in Europe can watch them in prime time is great. Um, that could have been done 25 years ago. This is not a new concept. The, the 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 fact that there's 24 time zones has existed for a long time okay so we've really got to get off our collective butts in hockey and understand that we are competing with LeBron James we are competing with the NFL going to London we are competing with every sport that is played in Europe to get a uh, market share 
over there. And if you look, you know, you're now at Real Madrid. Yes. If you if we use the model that the Premier League teams in soccer and Real Madrid and Bayern Munich have used and expand on those uh, in terms of getting eyeballs and ears, um, paying attention to our sport, I think we'd be a lot better served. I think the NHL has reluctantly not invested any capital in Europe for years and they need to start doing that and they already have a very cultivated marketplace for hockey there. It's not like you're going to China and in China the challenge will be different because we actually have to create a hockey culture in China. In Europe we already have in Northern Europe a, ho a hockey culture that exists and now we need to figure out how to monetize that and the way we do that is I think we, we do that by bringing the game to them. We bring that game to them either on the internet during prime time hours. I would suggest that the National Hockey League should seriously consider bringing that, their all-star game to London or Paris or Berlin and showcasing all the superstars of the National Hockey League, 50% of which are going to be Europeans already. Okay, And being a little bit more creative in terms of how we market this sport in Europe and potentially in China. Well, you, you know, I, I want to just kind of double click on China, cause, and David, I want to give you a chance to I respond. Just, I just wish I'd known it was so simple. <laughs> I could have just run out and done it. Well, look, I, I mean, let's, let's, so let's just talk about that a little bit. It, to me, it seems like China presents a really big opportunity. Uh, hockey is uh, not well penetrated there right. yet, and, and yet we've got a Winter Olympics coming to Beijing. Uh, uh, the the uh, Prime Minister has said he wants 300 million new participants in winter sports between now and the Olympics. 300 million, I mean, this, that is just a little smaller than the size of the entire United States. So, D David, tell me about the league's efforts in China. We'll just ask a little bit more about that since, since we, that's, it's come up. Sure. Uh, so we started about three years ago investigating China and seeing what that opportunity could look like. In the context of looking at that opportunity, we met with business leaders, we met with the government, we met with basically anybody that we could, NBA China, anybody we could get some background before we step foot into the country to really get a sense of the way you can go into a country like that. You can't just run in and demand what you want. It doesn't work that way. So it took us about two years to really get enough of an infrastructure set up where we could get teams to want to go over there and play games. In the context of that, we started media deals where we cultivated relationships with CTTV and Tencent to get our games on at all, which they had no interest in it for the last 10 years. Um, we were able to get that, build that, get some people who were behind what we wanted to do. Then we worked closely with the government to get them to instill a ball hockey program in some of the uh, school systems to try and get young kids more involved in the sport. We began running clinics where we tried to get kids to see what it was like to play the game. Mm -hmm. The fact is, as you point out, in a country of 1.4 billion, there were about 5,000 registered hockey players. So we had a lot of work to Zero. do. Yeah, basically. Right. So we had a lot of work to do to try and teach kids about what hockey is about. But we were using the government's interest in the Olympics to try and build that, to follow through that, and figure out how we could uh, target into that. What became clear from the government's perspective is they wanted us to play games. So we brought over two teams. We did quite a bit of work there in terms of that. That being said, there are other areas we would like to get into, but we simply can't because right now it is very difficult. For example, licensed content and merchandise. Very difficult to get that into China with all the tariffs and all the things that you need to do. We are in the process of working with uh, Fanatics, our partner, to do that. But that's part of what we're trying to, to figure out. Also, anytime you play games in China, you're talking about a major trip for a team. So you have to really figure out who's going to want to do it, who's going to be prepared to do it, and how is it going to work. So yeah, there's a ton of things I'd love to be doing in China. We'd love to be playing regular season games there. We'd love to be having primetime uh, telecasts there. There's lots of things. But realistically, each market, as I said at the beginning, you have to analyze in its own case. And in China, we've got a long way to go. Hopefully, we can pull something together where we've actually got some business inroads by the Olympics. But we still have a lot of work that we have to do just to understand and build in that market in a meaningful way. You look at the NBA, it took them 15, 20 years to get to the point where they actually built what they have now. We can't be under the impression that we're going to somehow be NBA China in, in five years. We've got a lot of work to do there. So Berkey, you've, you've led a bunch of teams. Tell us, I mean, let's talk about China. When you were, when you were running, would you, would you have sent one of your teams to China if the league had asked you? Yeah. 
I, I, went, I went overseas with my teams twice. We did training camp. When I ran the Canucks, we did training camp in Stockholm. And uh, then after the year after we won the Cup in Anaheim, we went to uh, the O2 Arena in London, England and played. The, the problem with, um, t you talk about playing games in Europe. The problem is the, the buildings in Europe don't generate NHL economics at all. Like you go to the Globe and Arena in Stockholm, seats 14,000 people, not 18 or 19. And there's 20 suites, not 60 or 80. And so until the new building in Cologne will generate NHL economics, new building in Prague, but up until you get those buildings there, there's no reason for us to go over and play regular season games there. The gate's not going to be the same and cover our travel. So, and it would have to be before we would want to play regular season games on a regular basis, we would want a division of four teams. So you go over and play Moscow, Prague, uh, Stockholm, you know, Paris, whatever the fourth city is, and we'd want to play eight games and be done with it. You know, we play each one twice and, and back, or six games. Right. And you know, somehow, if they said to us, we're going to play two regular seasons a game, regular season games every year for the next four years, your team's got to go over and play twice, we'd say no. We'd say no, we'll go once and we'll help grow the league, but if it's part of our schedule, I'm not going to put that wear and tear on my players. So I think we're a ways away from it. I think we're going to get there. I think there will be a European division at some point. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be alive to see it because I think it's going to take a, a, well, quite a bit of time. I don't think we can snap our fingers and make it happen. Because of the limitations on infrastructure. So yes. Someone's got to make the investment yep. and here. And we'd have to agree on an ice size. Uh, you know, we don't want to play regular season games on an a Olympic right. size rink. We'd have to agree on either a hybrid ice size like they have in Helsinki. Their rink is 91 feet wide, which is what I think our rink should be at. Uh, or we'd have to agree to that, and then they'd have to generate enough money for us to give up a home gate. Like the Toronto Maple Leafs to give up a home gate, you know what that is. That's, that's a lot of money. They don't pull it out of the Global Arena right now. Got it. David, do you think that as you're talking about international partners, that is that a potential lane that the league might consider driving down? Is finding uh, a partner, a, a Deutsche Bank, a, a someone who might want to put cash in in exchange for an equity position in the league, or is that sort of too fantastic to consider right now. Yeah, I, I mean, look, it's a dangerous proposition because I don't know how we would value it at this point. I mean, that's been the big question mark is, I will agree that we have placed, we have a long way to go in terms of where we can fully build and how we can fully build. I think that there are things that we're headed in the right direction. I think there's still a lot that we have left to do and there's a lot that we will do. But if we're gonna run out with an equity position right now, we would be doing it in a position of weakness in a position of we don't know what the valuation is. And what it really comes down to is there will come a point in time, I suspect in China, where there will be an equity position. I don't think, I don't realistically think that happens in Europe, but in China I could definitely see that happening. And right now, it's just too early for us to pull that together. Yeah, I, I understand exactly what you mean. You know, it is it is a speculation business at that point. I remember uh, about five, uh, some of facts checking, it was about, about five years ago that the NBA sold 10% of NBA China off to uh, ABC, Disney. ABC Disney, and every team got a nice check, and we're all wondering. It's nice to get a you know a check for 10 percent of something that really isn't really in your radar, and I don't think we'll ever know. Was it the right size check? The wrong size check? Was it the right time? So, it's uh, it is a speculation. Yeah, it's it's, it, but, it's it, a real analysis that you have to do, and it's something that you just you have to be willing to take the risk of undervaluing if you're going to do it. And there may come a point in time where we have to do that in order to put in the kind of capital we need to to do the things we need to do in China because it isn't cheap but we're, we're going to take it slow and make sure we do it the right way but I think I think if I could just comment on that in relation to the NHL in Europe and China one of the barriers to entry that that exists in China uh, that perhaps the Chinese government's going to be willing to, to undertake is the cost of infrastructure right. you know building hockey arenas for minor hockey players as much as it is building a, a 19,000 seat arena in one of these cities is a huge capital project. You know, arenas here in, in Canada probably cost $5 million per pack. That's a lot of money that you don't need if you're playing soccer or basketball uh, for the most part. Um, the same thing happens in Europe. So there's no doubt to, to Berkey's comment, I think the National Hockey League is not going to go or shouldn't go to, to Europe until the physical in infrastructure for National Hockey League hockey is there. The difference between Europe and China right now is the infrastructure at the lower levels already exists. And the NHL, to my mind, needs to 
take some of the capital that they're receiving from the expansion franchises from Vegas and Seattle. There's $1.15 billion coming into the coffers, and as opposed to that money just going into um, somebody's bank account, take $50 million of that, which is what, 5%, less than 5%, um, and now create a business plan in Europe where you're actually um, uh, sowing the seeds of growth in Europe um, the reality of it is, to, to my mind, that based on working with clients from Europe and traveling to Europe many, many times over the last few years, the caliber of hockey in Europe is actually getting worse, not better. And I, I don't say that the players are getting worse. The caliber of hockey that's being played in Sweden or Finland is getting worse because those players are chasing the dollars here in North America. and. Um, as a result, their leagues themselves are starting to suffer because the caliber, the, the communities that are watching the games recognize that the caliber of play today without Elias Pettersson playing for his Swedish club and him playing in Vancouver is lower. So the growth of 30% European players coming to North America rather than 10% from 20 years ago has taken away value over there. And I think the NHL has a huge opportunity to interject itself and create value for those hockey communities by repatriating, at some point in time, the Elias Pettersons or the Alexander Ovechkins or the Marcus Naslins back to Europe and creating a value proposition if they want to take the time and effort to, um, to farm that opportunity. I really believe there's a huge opportunity over there. Will it take time? Of course it will, okay? But we've 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 missed the opportunity for 20 or 25 years. I don't think we should miss that opportunity anymore. And if the NHL decides it wants to miss that opportunity, who knows whether the KHL starts expanding to the West and takes advantage of that opportunity in London, in Paris, in Cologne, because somebody's gonna take advantage of that opportunity. And it should be the best league in the world, which is the NHL. And quite honestly, those people that understand hockey in Europe, um, and Berkey, you were in London, um, you know, those, those games in the O2 arena were sold out 15 years ago, and the, fan, the fans were great. And I think London, if it's got the, the proper arena, will accept National Hockey League hockey over time, as will Stockholm, as will, I think, Paris, as will a German city. And if we can ever convince Putin to allow a team into St. St. Petersburg or Moscow, where they have money, the fans will go nuts as well, because they'll be seeing the best product in the world. That's really interesting, uh, and I had uh, I was that was not on my radar at all. So what you're really saying is that the NHL, the best hockey in the world, this as it becomes an increasingly you know haves and have-nots unequal world, we're taking the best talent out, and that's going to hurt the business proposition in the short term, but potentially in the long run, as well. You've got less grassroots interest in the sport. Uh, no, I, I don't. Well, I, listen, I, I think it's going uh, over time. If all the best players are leaving and coming to North America, and the NHL doesn't fill a gap. Right. back in Sweden and in Finland, yeah, there's potential for the sport to decline because now the best players in the world are leaving. The reason, and I'll give, I'll give you a different example. I used to work a, a fair bit in the, the Maritimes and recruit players from the Maritimes. And they had an option to come play in Quebec, play in Ontario, or play in, um, uh, play in the Western Hockey League because there were no franchises that existed in the Maritime. So if you go back, there was no St. John's team, there was no, no place for Sidney Crosby or Nathan McKinnon to actually see their heroes play at the Sportsplex in Halifax. Those kids would have been playing in Ramouski or in Sudbury or in Medicine Hat. And the generation of players that has come out of the Maritimes in the last 15 to 20 years, once the Quebec Major Junior League expanded, to Quebec and the players from the Maritimes were required to play in the Quebec League rather than playing all over Canada has grown exponentially and the talent that has developed from Sidney Crosby to Nathan McKinnon to others right. you know uh, is, is incredible it's no different than the impact that the Raptors had on the Toronto marketplace for basketball look at the kids that are coming out of Toronto now that are playing in the NBA and it's because they could see they could feel they could touch the product if the NHL goes over to Sweden and people can see and touch the product, the mindset that their loyalty, which currently exists to AIK or Your Garden or Modo or uh, Faryastad, 
will supersede the NHL, I think is a load of crap. The NHL will go in there, all of a sudden everybody's going to see Elias Pettersson playing for Stockholm, and he will be the hero of the nation, and the, the team in Stockholm will be the team for the country, as will the, the London Lions, as will the Paris Fleur de Lis, or whatever, because their homegrown kids are now playing at home, and hockey will thrive in Paris, and hockey will thrive in London, and hockey will continue to thrive in Stockholm, because they can, they can live it, they can touch it, they can feel it, they can breathe it. And the media will pick up on it and start promoting the sport, because the reality of it is, the NBA and the NHL in North America get free advertising, okay? The media comes and watches the game and broadcasts the game. In Europe, you're not getting that. The, the media in Europe doesn't care about the NHL because they can't smell it, they can't feel it, they can't touch it. Eventually, if the NHL takes steps, and it might start off with an all-star game in London, it might start off with the whole you know, Eastern Conference having training camp in Europe, and one team is in London, one team's in Stockholm, one's in Helsinki, they play their exhibition games over there, they all come back that, uh, so that nobody is prejudiced in terms of starting their regular season at the wrong time, and they start the season here. But now all of a sudden, Bern loves uh, the New Jersey Devils because they tr had training camp for Nico Heeshire, and Stockholm loves the Vancouver Canucks. Right. And you'll see people in Stockholm wearing Vancouver Canucks jerseys because Elias Pettersson was at training camp in Stockholm. Got it. And you'll see everybody in Helsinki wearing Patrick Line jerseys because from the Winnipeg Jets because they had training camp here. And now there is a connection. That's what sport is, it's a connection. It's, a, it's the tribe of the Maple Leafs or the tribe mm -hmm. of the Vancouver Canucks or the tribe of the, of the, uh, uh, of the Raptors and joining that tribe, and when that tribe is successful, feeling that glow that you helped, somehow you helped Kawhi Leonard sink that three-pointer in the final minute because of your support. That's what, that's what sports is, it's tribalism. Well, your, ideal, uh, your idea of doing something uh, at scale that, uh, I mean, that's a, really, that's a really exciting idea, but it, it kind of raises an interesting issue, and I'd like to hear from each of you guys, who, whose job is it to grow grassroots participation in your sport? Is it the league? Yes. So Brian, would you like to expand upon that? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're a fun panelist, Brian. And well, there, I mean, that the teams, believe it or not, there are teams that make money and there are teams that don't make money. And the teams that don't make money, what, what Anton just described is a fantasy to them. This is, this is futuristic. Uh, take some more drugs and have some more fun. Um, the teams with resources, the league won't let you do a lot of things on your own anyhow. You know, so if you say, we're gonna, the Maple Leafs are going to open an office in China, the league will say, not so fast. Correct. Well, the league will open the office and we'll, we'll handle the licensing over there. So I don't think teams like, we asked to go to, we went to the Flames, well, I say we, I left the Flames in May. We were going to China and we went to China, the team did, and, and we took a bunch of business people on that plane just, just to develop business relationships and give them a free trip to China and there were some Chinese Canadian people on the plane that their businesses and that's as far as the league, they would go with us. The league is like, okay, this is nice, that's fun, have fun, but any commercial opportunities over there will be under the league banner. So that's problem number one. They want to control it, we want them to control it. They have more expertise than we do. So if I called David and said, I got a great idea, um, we'd, we'd want the league to execute it overseas, not us. We don't have the resources or personnel or time for that. And I know Art's impatient, or Anton's impatient, but I, we have faith in the league that the pace, we open an office in Europe. People forget that. We opened an office in Europe in, what, 2000? It was closed seven years later because we couldn't do any business. Now the climate's changed. Now we're going to put another office in Europe. Maybe where was the other one? Switzerland. Switzerland. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're going to put one in China and maybe in, I don't know, Germany. It's probably a better time to do it. It's probably got a better chance to succeed. But they've got a much better chance to succeed with the shield than we do with the Calgary Flames logo. So, and they can market all the players, not just our players. So I'd say that falls squarely in the league. And you know, we we pay these guys a lot of money at the league, so. No, well, before really, we that, give that Dave, David a chance to weigh on that, did, did, did you no. find that frustrating as a team president or <laughs> that you couldn't do it yourself or do you just want to turn no. over the league? And, no, it didn't frustrate you. I go back 31 years, okay? So my first job with a team was 1987. 
And so I think that's 31 years. I won't ask any Edmonton fans to check the math, but um, at that time, the league was tiny. Uh, even five years later or six years later when I went to work for Gary Bettman, I think we had, I don't know, 50 employees, maybe 60. We're all on one, one floor of one office on Fifth Avenue. It was tiny. It was mom and pop. I mean, the store, when I was the assistant gym with the Canucks, our, our inventory in the store was worth $40,000 in our store with their golf shirts and all the stuff we sold. It was mom and pop. Gary Bettman has, has turned it into a juggernaut. So now... The league has done all this stuff. Now there's 450 employees instead of 50 or 500. I don't know. David, how many? Six. 600, okay. And so they have expertise. They've got boots on the ground. They've got relationships. They can get to this stuff much quicker than we can. And we trust in their ability. Our lesson from working with the NHL has been every team I've been on, the league has helped us with everything we've ever done and never hurt us in anything. They'll stop you from doing something, but the league has basically said, that's a good idea, we'll execute it for you, let's go. And they've just grown and grown and grown. So I have no problem if the league says, leave China to us, we'll fix it. I know there are severe barriers to entry there, but I think Anton's vision is right. I think his time frame might be unrealistic. I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. Not that he's said it would, but. And, and I'll talk about it from a team perspective. We, the, the leagues control uh, territories outside of our, uh, outside of our market. So, you know, using the NBA, we've got all of Ontario. Using, you know, the NHL, we've got about 75 miles. But I think the opportunity is to work in partnership. You know, are we interested in getting on the ground and working in countries like China? Absolutely. But maybe to, to, to Anton's point earlier, I think there is opportunity by, you know, team and league working together to help build our collective brands, you know, in the Nordics. So the Make Leafs have a tremendously rich history in Sweden. You know, you go back to the Borea Salmings, to the, to the Matt Sundins, uh, to current players. Um, uh, Inga, on, Inga Hammerstrom. There we go. Um, and, uh, and, and, and a not to be named yeah, restricted free agent. So there's a ton of equity between the Maple Leafs in that, in that marketplace. So what opportunity do the teams and leagues have to work together to get you know, um, uh, businesses in that market interested in helping grow the game? So might the league allow for grassroots activation of a particular set of teams, call it Toronto and Vancouver, that have particular equity in that market? And in turn, is there a benefit for the team where maybe we're projecting some ring board advertising, other sort of engaging, uh, you know, promotions and activity, you know, digitally or socially or through the app? Um, that's a benefit to the team, and I think that's the sort of opportunity uh, that team and league has, you know, to work together to start unlocking that. Um, leagues control it. As teams, we understand it. I think there's an opportunity for us to work collaboratively to to, to start that process. Yeah. So. Um Going back first to what Anton said, I actually, I, I think you're right. I think that in the long run, having a, a, a real presence there is one that we could definitely grow on for all the reasons you stated. The one thing we do have to keep in mind, and it's a tricky thing for us to deal with and we deal with it all the time, is the local leagues, the domestic leagues have a mm -hmm. following. They have a, a good relationship with us, with the IIHF, with the players, with the infrastructure and the youth teams that are building. and. It's very difficult to walk that line between we want to grow the NHL and it's not coming into harm those domestic leagues. You, are, you may be right, I actually haven't done this study to know whether Swedish hockey is suffering compared to say 10 years ago, but clearly once, if we put a team in there, they're gonna take that as a, an assault on their local league. That's why we try to be careful, we try to figure it, we try to take it all into account. All of that being said, it's one of the many factors we take into account that also, um, take into account the points you made, which are, are dead on correct. I think from a, when you asked who executes this, yes, yeah, the league, but the fact of the matter is we can't do it without the commitment of the teams and the commitment of the players. So as much as we go into Sweden and we wanna build or do, or like this last, last two weeks ago we're in Finland. Finland was great. By any account, it was a phenomenal experience. But it was also a phenomenal experience because the Jets and the Panthers did everything they could to build it. And it was a phenomenal experience because Patrick Lyony and uh, Sasha Barkov gave of their time and their effort and, and did things that players don't have to do to build that market, to meet with kids, to go to hospitals, to do practices, to, to do whatever outreach they were asked to do because they wanted to be in that community. If we as the league put on those games, they sell out and people come. But we don't leave with the kind of legacy we left with where a bunch of kids and a bunch of news um, organizations are following around these guys 
unless they're prepared to do silly things like eat wings in a restaurant or important things like visit a local children's hospital. Those, those so aren't those. silly things. Eating wings as hockey players is like, <laughs> that's, that's natural. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so all of this, where we may take the lead on it, there's, there's no way we're successful without teams, without players, and then you gotta throw in our partners, our media partners and our, our sponsorship partners who help to activate and do a lot of the stuff that helps to build. If, if yeah. I could just comment on that. Well, I would say one thing with that. Just, you took stars from those countries, that's why it worked. If you'd have taken over the Winnipeg Jets with no fins, good luck getting 300 yeah. bucks for a ticket. And, and, and I, I, I agree with Berkey's comment, but the, the point I was gonna make in relation to, to David, your comments was that what you described these players doing, and I think Brian can attest to this, that's what players do in their home communities already. They're going to hospitals. They're eating chicken wings with people in, in, in the Boston pizza. They are interacting with individuals in their community on a regular basis and selling the sport. So when you say the NHL couldn't do it without the teams and without the players, that, that, to me that's, you know, that, that's obvious because uh, the I NHL see, is the teams and the players and you have a league in which the players, I believe, and Brian, Brian deals with this on a daily basis, are more invested in helping to promote their league as much as they possibly can and rarely if ever turn down opportunities when clubs come to them and say, hey, listen, can you go to that hospital? Can you appear here, appear there? Like, these guys are the best guys in the world. Yeah, I say this every year at this conference. We are blessed. We are so fortunate. The athletes we have get it. They're polite. They show up on time. They, when we do hospital visits, they do it cheerfully and graciously. It's not grudgingly. It's not, uh, we are blessed. They're, 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 the way they play the game, they're fearless. They'll play hurt. They'll lie to our doctors to get on the ice. Like, so they're warriors in the true sense, but they're such gentlemen. We are blessed. We, it's a wonderful asset of ours. And, and I think to, to go to the point in Finland, that's, that's what they projected in Finland. That's what they'll project in Stockholm or in London, wherever they play hockey. Uh, and if we can assist them in selling themselves and selling the sport, not only based on their unbelievable abilities on the ice, but their unbelievable personalities and a genuine willingness to be part of the community, whether that be Edmonton, which most of these players aren't from. You know, at right. the end of the day, the right. Edmonton Oilers, I'm sure, participate on a regular basis in all kinds of community adventures, but none of them are from Edmonton. Um, and it would be the same in any city that the National Hockey League goes into. So the ambassadors of the sport, you got them in your back pocket already. It's how we use those ambassadors to monetize the sport in all of these places, and Europe might be far-fetched for now, but it's the same thing, the same challenge in Vegas, and I think we saw last year with the unfortunate incident the night before the NHL game in Vegas, what wonderful ambassadors our hockey players are in the Las Vegas community, and when Seattle gets a franchise, Seattle will see exactly the same thing. And, and look, I think all of that's fair, but I do think you have to take into, and by the way, I. Absolutely second, third, and fourth, the, we have the best players for going out, representing us. They always represent us in the best possible way. Makes my, my job a lot easier. But there is a fundamental difference between trying to promote the NHL in Finland with Patrick Lyonne and Sasha Barkov and trying to promote the NHL in London with no United Kingdom players. It's difficult, and as Berkey pointed out, we do really easy in Finland. When you bring back Patrick Laine and Barkov, we sell out at huge numbers and people go crazy. There's a strategy that you have to build, and you see a perfect example is the NFL. The NFL has been working at the UK for it's gotta be close to 25 years now. They don't have a lot of players from the UK. They started with, we're targeting this market, and we're just gonna keep coming back and back and back, and they'll tell you for the first, I'm guessing 15 years, it was loss leader, and it may still be, I don't know but they're building something, but it's a lot harder to build when you don't have the natural link to that particular community. And so, yeah, I, it's true that maybe everybody from Edmonton isn't from Edmonton, but they're playing games in Edmonton every night. There's something that they're building there. And 
if we go past for a moment the putting a, a team in London, the actual just building something in London right now is one of the tricky things we're focused on, is how to do that. It's a great market, it's a great sports market, and it's a great North American sports market, but it's not one that has been particularly accommodating to uh, leagues building very quickly there. You see NBA, you see baseball, they're going there. We'll probably find a way to go there as well, but it is that's one that's sort of the other side of the Sweden or the Finland model. Well, it's a little bit scary, I'm, I'm, I'm certain, if, if I'm in your shoes, because we saw the NFL launch NFL Europe and then do a lot of fanfare and, and look like they were going to get way out in front and then shutter it a few years later. In fact, when they went back with games, I, I was pretty negatively biased. I thought, I thought it would fail, given the fact that NFL had failed, and yet it seems to be, seems to be really taken. Yeah, it seems to be doing well. Now, what it seems to me, is that, as we think about these global, sport, as these global sports opportunities, is that the top leagues do well. To me, I think one of the reasons the NFL uh, in, failed in Europe with, with NFL Europe as a league was it was obvious it was not the best players. So, you know, turning to soccer uh, and, and football, Jordan, Major League Soccer, Huge, huge growth over the last 20 years. It will shake at the beginning. Look, the league looks to be in good health now. How, do, how does MLSC see uh, their role in international soccer, international football, and, and what do you think the, the impact will be on that sport, but also in other sports and leagues, given the fact we've got a World Cup coming to North America in 2026? Absolutely, and I think, you know, um uh, amazing how far the team has come in the, in the, in the 12 seasons that we had and uh, or, or that we've been in existence. And I think if you look over the last number of years, uh, one of the ambitions, you know, uh, where, you know, as, as part of the bill that Tim Bezbachenko has been responsible for, has been to put our team on the global soccer map. And I think that was our ambition and one that uh, we've certainly, we've certainly done. We've done that with performance. We've done that with the athletes. And quite frankly, I think we've done that with some really creative and intelligent uh, marketing led by our, uh, our, our team that's, that's allowed our team to stand out and get recognized beyond just Major League Soccer, but from a from a, a global basis as well. So, you know, we've we've had all those types of conversations on, you know, can we take our team on a global tour to China? Can we, um, you know, build our brands and create, you know, different opportunity in in, in South America? And and that's that's certainly um, you know on our radar and 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 the types of opportunities that. Uh, we've been looking to to commercialize. If I can bring it back to get the lens, and, and my responsibility is how do you find global brands that are interested in building their brands through an association, you know, with with our teams, and and um, you know, one of those focal points, you know, much like David Beckham was, much like when we brought Sebastian, Sebastian Giovanco over, you've got World Cup 2026. That's just about eight eight years away, and I think as uh, you know, the the world uh, the world of football, you know, dawns back on you know on our market. I think it's an incredible opportunity to you know to you know to to connect back to some of the points that Anton made around, um, you know, what do the, you know, what do the Sidney Crosby's and, and uh, Nathan McKinnon's do? Well, historically, you know, the world of soccer meant uh, you develop great Canadian athletes here and you move off to somewhere else in the world. And I think, you know, with a World Cup coming here in 2026, I think that changes the, the dynamic uh, completely. I think you've got a bunch of Canadian athletes that not only want to grow up within our systems and our infrastructures, but they rem want to remain here and play. And we're starting to see, you know, from a pure football perspective, the benefits of that, um, you know, the Vancouver Whitecaps uh, made a, uh, a move in the last couple months to sell Alfonso Davies is a very uh, profitable move, you know, for them. At the same time, uh, we, I had a, heard a story the other day about you know a 14, 15 year old kid that we're looking to bring into our system, which you're allowed to talk to in the in the world of world of soccer. And now having Jonathan Asario, who was a kid that grew up in Toronto, became a star, became um, a focal point for the team. Instead of growing up and saying I want to go and, and and play football somewhere else in the world, they want to grow up and support their hometown team like Jonathan Asario did. So so that's one example that you know from a from a global global perspective um, that Toronto SC now is on that you know is on that radar. Um, so so it's been a it's been a huge dynamic shift for what you know Toronto FC means in the world of football. Um, but I think, you know, World Cup 2026 is going to be a huge inflection point for, um, you know, where the national team goes and, and gets us from a global perspective, um, you know, onto that global map as well. 
Good. Can I ask a question, Dave? Yes. Just in relation to soccer, because yeah. I, I, lo I love soccer and I love watching Toronto oh, FC. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to get tickets to the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> we know your point. Anyway, I love soccer. Yeah. Forget about Berkey. Yeah. I uh, love, uh, anytime you got free tickets, just let me know. Um, yeah. Or a box or something like that. I'd rather watch two guys paint a barn. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you a question about your marketing. And, yep. and, and, is it your belief that you can actually market the TFC brand internationally uh, by marketing the brand, or do you at this stage of the game have to actually market the individual players like the Sebastian Javinkos and uh, the you know, Uruguayan player in South America versus a Canadian? Because I, I, I would believe, my personal impression is that at this point in time, um, TFC probably hasn't done enough as a franchise mm -hmm. when you're competing with Real Madrid or Manchester United or Manchester City to garner a heck of a lot of attention. So you have to focus on the superstars of your organization right now. And once you build up that, that Toronto FC or you know New York Yankees tradition of winning year after year after year, TFC actually becomes a a real brand because of the success that you've had through the players that you've had and you can now go out to a, to a company and say hey you mm -hmm. buy the label uh, you don't we don't need Sebastian Javinko because we are the New York Yankees of soccer in North America at this point in time you, you do realize this isn't easy to do oh yeah to win every year and then turn into the Yankees you realize there are other teams that try really? to win yes. well we went right, right I thought we got all the year. smart guys up here that you could figure it out <laughs> Well, actually, it's, it's, it's the reason I was asking the question as to league or, or team, and I'm not sure what the answer is. You know, uh, what I can tell you is, you know, some of the the growth we've seen in international football has been led by the by the teams, not by the leagues. You know, the Premiership yeah. is way behind what Man U, Man City, Liverpool, Chelsea is doing. La Liga is light years behind what we're doing. In you know, we have a China office. And we we don't have a La Liga China office yet. Yeah. So, you know, I really um, I think we get data on both sides of it. And I'm, I'm interested. To, you know, see who, who can do this really well over the long haul. Well, I, I think the, the average fan that's tribal is either, you know, going to identify with a player or with that shield or with that, that team jersey. You mean the team jersey, not yeah. the league shield? Well, yeah, not the league I shield. I agree. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the, there, there are Liverpool fans in Toronto that right. somehow have a connection to Liverpool. Right. And there are, you know, I've got a buddy who's a Manchester City fan. And there are other players, or other players, there are other individuals that live and die by Cristiano Ronaldo mm -hmm. or by Lionel Messi or whoever it is. And it's, again, creating that tribal connection. And if Cristiano Ronaldo is with Real Madrid uh, and he gets traded to Juventus, that person's loyalty has gone from Real Madrid to Juventus just because they're superstar. It would be like Jean Beliveau being traded from the Montreal Canadiens to the to the uh, Detroit Red Wings. I would still be a Jean Beliveau fan and he would still be my favorite player and I'd start cheering for the Detroit Red Wings. And it, trying to develop those connections and understand those connections I think is part of the challenge that we all have, have up here in terms of trying to monetize our industries. Great. So I've, the moderator is telling me we're I'm the moderator, sorry, you're the referee. <laughs> Tell me that we're, we're late on time. Do you want to take questions, Berkey? How do you want to do this? You're the moderator. Yeah, great. <laughs> we've left some time at the end here. Uh, we've got a great panel of esteemed big thinkers in this space. And we want to ask anybody up here a question. Is that a bathroom break? I for a microphone. Mike, perfect. I have a question for Mr. Proper. Um, I understand that hockey is very much still in its infancy stage in China. Uh, however, the KHL has had a pretty solidified presence there for the past few years. I wanted to know uh, how difficult you think it'll be to make up um, the ground that the KHL has already covered, what you think the market share will be, and what kind of impact having someone like Wayne Gretzky, who's probably the greatest ambassador for the sport, um, go to China and promote it for the KHL. In, we've looked a lot. We've got, we've got pretty good relationships with the Kunlun Red Star. We spent a lot of time there. We hosted their women's team, um, and we've met with them quite a bit. The way we view China is, if you take a look at a, a country of 1.4 billion, which makes it four times the size of uh, the U.S. and Canada combined, there's enough room for a lot of people to coexist. And right now, if you look at, for example, where we are, um, 
and where hockey is in general, we all need as much help as we can. I mean, the KHL team, Kunlun, they're doing everything they can. They're still playing to very small crowds, and it, through no fault of their own, they're just they're trying to build something. You've got federations, the Finnish federation, the Czech federation, the Swedish federation, the Canadian um, hockey, all trying to build in China. You've got us trying to build in China. You, there's a lot going on there, and I think none of us at this point certainly look at it as we're in competition with one another. We all look at it as, I can't do it all by myself. I need the help of these other guys that are also out there doing it. So if they're on the ground day after day doing what they do, and we're coming in, playing games once a year, but putting our games on television and, and media and getting things out, again, 1.4 billion people, there's enough there that we'll all have some piece of the pie and they'll have the local fans that are there. And we would exist much the way we exist in a place like Sweden or Finland, where top of the top, top, top players, the best in the world is the NHL, but there's still the ability to see the sport in that local market. If we were to take an approach that was more aggressive, I think we would just wind up eating each other up and probably working it to the detriment of building hockey, which in the long run is not obviously beneficial to any of us. Now, if you ask me 20 years from now, I may have a different view, but right now, that's the way we look at it. If, if I can just comment on that, I know the question was directed towards David. I, I don't think the impression that you gave that, that Kun Luen is that established in China is really the truth. I, I don't think they've got a really strong foothold at all. Um, I, to, to me, what's happened with the KHL is the KHL has historically gone into uh, untraditional marketplaces and tried to buy their way into the situation because of economic deals rather than hockey deals. And those have failed in Zagreb, Croatia, and a lot of other cities in uh, in Western Europe. I think it's going to fail in, in China as well because they uh, unlike what I think the NHL is trying to do with the Chinese government is to actually create an infrastructure that's lasting. Uh, and I don't really think that what Kunlun is doing is really lasting. It's just it just happens to be a, a professional hockey franchise in uh, in China that's part of the uh, Continental Hockey League, and I don't know that it's particularly well run or well attended or well marketed. Well, that's it, isn't it? I mean, you know, if you get a cash infusion, you can have fun for a little while, but. At some point, it's got to be self-sustaining in those marketplaces. You know, I've, I've spent some time in China consulting with the Chinese Basketball Association, which is not bad basketball, and we've got you know former NBA stars there on their way on their way in or their way out. Sometimes, uh, 17 teams, not one turns a profit. Yeah, I, point, I agree with that summation about, about the KHL team too. I don't think they've built up any equity whatsoever. So it's nice, yeah. right at the end of the panel, I can agree with something <laughs> Anton said. Yeah. Well, it, it, to me, it's just a venture that Gazprom finances for the Russian government to try to get into a marketplace, and when it doesn't work after two or three years, they pull their money out and the team folds. I guess we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Hey, thanks for agreeing. Great. I'd uh, like to thank our panelists. like to thank our audience. It sounds like it's been an incredible day here at Primetime Sports, so enjoy what's next. Thanks very much. Thank you.